like to introduce myself a little bit first. My name is Sarah May, uh, and I am a JavaScript and Ruby developer at Pivotal Labs in San Francisco. And I've been at Pivotal Labs for about two years. Pivotal is a consulting company, which means that I see a lot of different projects coming through. Um, before I was at Pivotal, I could spend a year, year and a half on one project, and now my average project lasts about two months. And in the last year, I've had five different projects using Backbone, one using Ember.js, and two that didn't use anything at all. So I've seen a lot of different ways that Backbone is used. Now, Backbone is a lightweight framework, uh, which is a blessing and a curse, right? Makes it different from Rails. Rails is very opinionated. There is a right place and a wrong place to put your code. Uh, but and, and one of the advantages of that is you can, as a Rails developer, go from one Rails app to the next and have some idea of where code is going to be. Backbone is not that way. Every Backbone project I've been on, the code looks completely different. And part of that is that Backbone is a fairly new technology. We don't have a lot of very well-established patterns for using it. Uh, and part of that is because Ruby developers in general aren't very good at JavaScript. So <laughs> myself included, I might add. So what I'm going to cover today is a little bit about what Backbone is, a little bit about the history of the relationship between JavaScript and Rails, um, and then we're going to come back and look at uh, some differences in terminology and what Backbone gives you, and then I'm going to show you two different patterns that I've seen for using Backbone in a real app. And uh, I'm going to be publishing these slides plus the annotated source code. So. Uh, from the rest of the talk later this week. Uh, you can find that on Twitter, so don't feel like you need to take exhaustive notes. Uh, so I'd like to start with a little poll. How many people have worked on a Rails app that used Backbone.js? Good portion of the room. Um, how many people are here just to find out what the hell Backbone is? Seems like a lot of the same hands got raised. That's interesting. <laughs> and how many people are here to find out whether your pattern of Backbone usage looks anything like mine? You see same people keep raising your hands. Okay. So, uh, so let's start with a little bit about what Backbone is. Uh, it is not an MVC framework for JavaScript, although you will see a lot of people refer to it that way. Uh, it gets lumped in with a lot of other frameworks that do do a more traditional MVC, but it's very confusing for us as Rails developers to think of it as an MVC framework because the M, the V, and the C are different than what we think of as the Rails M, V, and C. So let's not think about MVC for a moment. Instead, think about Backbone as uh, a set of cubbies in which you can put different types of code so to keep them organized, right? So unfortunately for us, the names of the cubbies in Backbone and the names of the cubbies in Rails are similar, and they don't do the same thing. So let's, let's break that down just a little bit. Uh, the first thing to know is that Backbone doesn't have anything called controllers, which is one reason why it's not an MVC framework, because there's no C in their MVC. But it has models, templates, and views. So, and then Rails, of course, has models, views, and controllers. So, but before we dive into this comparison of terminology, let's talk a little bit about why you would want to do this in the first place. Why would you want to work on, on breaching this impedance mismatch and understanding two different frameworks if you already understand one of them? <laughs> so the basic idea here is better organization of your JavaScript. Right? And I want to unpack that a little bit and talk about how we got to the point where we need a framework to sort all this out. Right? So what's wrong with plain old JavaScript? So. I want to talk about the evolution of our relationship with JavaScript. Uh, and in some ways, this also is the evolution of my relationship with JavaScript and Rails. Uh, and I think a lot of developers go through these same phases. And the first phase is the no JavaScript phase. And this is the phase in which you use the JavaScript helpers that Rails gives you. For me, when I first came to Rails in 2006, I came from J2EE land. Uh, so I was learning Ruby, I was learning Rails, and to make it worse, I had been like a back-end engineer, right? Which means that I didn't know a whole lot about JavaScript and CSS. Uh, and all of those JavaScript helpers seemed really amazing and magical. Right? I could write Ruby, and I'd get JavaScript. Which is like, can't explain that, right? So let's look at an example. Uh, if you do this in your view, you will get a piece of rendered HTML in your form that looks something like this. Now, this is the nice, unobtrusive Rails 3 version. So the key here is the data remote attribute. Uh, when you include Rails.js, it looks for forms with that data attribute. Uh, 
attaches to them, and then anytime you hit submit, we'll submit it Ajaxly rather than doing a page refresh, which is kind of cool, a little bit magic. Let's look at something even more magic. If you put this in your Rails view, it magics up a whole form, which is too big to fit on this slide. But what it does is make a link that when you click it, will go to the URL using Ajax that you specify. In this case, it's the add to cart URL. Get the response and put that response into the div that you specify, in this case, the div with ID cart. So that's all you got to do. And it does that kind of magically. So this kind of thing is, is great for simple interactions, right? And for a lot of apps, it's probably sufficient, to be honest with you. Um, but for me and for the type of apps that I do, I tend to think of the Rails helper as kind of like scaffolding, which is like it's great to whip something up really fast at a hack night, but it's not something I would ever put into a real app. Um, and we're at the point now where JavaScript really needs to be a first class citizen in our web applications. And that means uh, basically not using these things. So, and one of the interesting questions about that, right, is why, why are we at that point? Why, why are we at the point where we need to, gr to graduate JavaScript into a real thing? And mostly this is because of the whole Web 2.0 thing, if you guys remember that. Uh, and what that did, besides shortening company names, was that it basically was, in reality, right, Web 2.0 was the product people starting to request more interactivity than the Rails JavaScript helpers could easily deliver. So what, for example, if you have a request and you want to update two different divs with different content, you couldn't make the JavaScript helpers do that, uh, but not without effort. And you do actually, at that point, have to start writing actual JavaScript, if only a little bit. And uh, when you get to that point, uh, it's actually easier to stop using the helpers and start using jQuery directly. Uh, which brings us to phase two, which I call the jQuery explosion phase. And this is what happens when you convert all of your Rails helpers calls into actual JavaScript. And it's called the explosion because you start getting stuff like this at the top of each of your views. Uh, you can see we're calling a jQuery plugin down there at the bottom. You end up usually with a big list of these. Uh, and here at the top, you're doing some pretty standard Ajax stuff. Uh, you're attaching to the submit event of a form, calling Ajax when it's caught and then updating a couple of different areas with content when the data comes back. Uh, you could imagine that this, this pretty quickly gets a little unwieldy, right? You've got one Ajax, it's already taking up, what, 10 lines of code. Uh, and what happens if you've got three or four of these, right? You end up with a bunch of stuff at the top of every view, and your views start looking messy, right? And you know, there's, there's different ways you can deal with this. You can pull all this stuff out into a file and then just include it into your view which, of course, is still conceptually messy. Uh, and, but the biggest problem with this is that it's really hard to test. The only way to test this JavaScript that you toss into your views, even if it's in another file and it's included, uh, is to do integration tests, which are very slow. And so the more interactivity your app accumulates, the slower your test suite gets. This is a bad thing. Uh, the other option, of course, is not to test it, uh, <laughs> which I know a lot of people opt for. Uh, I would probably be fired if I suggested that was an option. Okay, so that gives us that brings us to page three, to phase three, right? Which is what happens when you start outgrowing the throw all the JavaScript in the top of your page uh, pattern. And this is a pattern that I've seen used a lot and is still used quite a bit, which is page objects. Uh, and what happens in this pattern is that we take all that JavaScript that is at the top of the view, and we uh, separate it into unit testable functions in a JavaScript object that's scoped to the page being rendered. So to take an example, here's a page object that contains the JavaScript we previously had thrown into the view. Uh, now it's got an initialized function. And we've also pulled out all of those anonymous functions that we had been using before, and we've given them names. And the advantage of this, of course, is that you can unit test each of these individually as a JavaScript unit test. And then all you have to do in your integration spec is make sure that you're calling initialize somewhere in the view. And so as, this, as your application gets bigger, what happens to this pattern is that you start creating subcomponents within the page class. So your initialize starts looking like this, right? So you've got bits of it that you do set up individually, uh, and each little subcomponent is in charge of setting itself up. So the JavaScript that was in your page goes from looking like this to looking something like this. And this is 
much nicer for a number of reasons. Testing, which I already mentioned. Uh, and also makes your, your views look nice, which for those of us who uh, are a little OCD about that, makes us feel good. And this pattern can actually take you pretty far. I mean, there are gems out there that will do this part for you, right? That will, will uh, figure out the name of the page class that's attached to the page you're rendering. For example, if you name it nicely so that you're in the images controller and the new action, it will look for a page class called images new and instantiate that for you. Um, so uh, so this, this pattern actually gets you pretty far. Uh, where it starts to break down is when your product people, again, wanting to keep up with competitors or I don't know which web we're on to now, 3.0, 4.0, .0, .0, I don't know. Uh, and they start requesting more page interactivity than you can reasonably do with Ajax and redirects. And uh, this is sort of a, an incremental addition over what they've requested before, right? So for example, when you add something to the cart, they want to re-render the cart area on the nav bar, which is a decent amount of, of markup. They want the related product sidebar to slide into view so that they can upsell you on stuff. Uh, so it's slightly more complicated than what they wanted before. And typically, at this point, what happens is you start thinking about doing some client-side rendering, maybe with handlebars or mustache or something. <laughs> you like that picture? I like that picture. So you might do just a little bit of client-side rendering at first, right? So you, you update a number on the notification div, or you, you know, put in a related product sidebar or something. But uh, when you start doing client-side rendering, a lot of other things start getting harder, right? The first, and, and the first thing is, with client-side rendering, you need to be able to know when you need to re-render things. So you need to put in a structure in place that will be able to render not only the page class, but then the subcomponents at the right time. Uh, and also, the other thing that gets really complicated is that your events start multiplying. I found this on Flickr. Isn't that amazing? This is a piece of conceptual art by someone who is trying to make a statement about data visualization. Uh, so the events get messy, right? Because in jQuery, events bubble up. And uh, so if you have a hierarchy in which you have a page class with a number of subcomponents, and you have component A, which is producing an event that component B needs to consume, it's up to the, their parent class, in this case the page class, to catch that event from component A and then push it down into component B. Um, so the page class starts having to know all about what all of its subcomponents want and what they're doing. Uh, either that or each component needs to know about what other components are interested in the events that it generates. Uh, and that gets super messy. And so you start thinking, huh, you know what would be nice? What would be nice if I had some kind of event system to deal with this? And right about that same time, you start thinking also, I wish there was some way I could mirror my objects, my model objects, between the server and the client. Right? If I've got a cart object, it would be awesome if I could just update some attributes on that cart object and call save, and it would know how to go out and save that data. Right? Because you end up writing the same restful Ajax methods over and over again for showing a cart, getting carts index, creating a cart, showing a product, creating a product. Uh, and if you've got a, a, a restful API that you're calling against, uh, you end up writing the same code over and over again. So it, there's, a, there's a point in, there in, in the increased interactivity of your website where this tips over into, OK, I need something a little more structured than what I have. And it's the client-side rendering, it's the events, and it's the model mirroring that really drives Rails developers into the arms of frameworks. And there's a lot of frameworks out there. Uh, there's, of course, they all solve this problem in slightly different ways. There's Backbone, and then there's a bunch of others. OK, I think that's it. There's probably been more since I made this slide yesterday. <laughs> Uh, and this is good, right? It's a reflection of the fact that, that we as a community have all basically hit the same JavaScript wall at the same time. And we're solving the problems that arise in different ways. So let's go back to looking at what, what Backbone actually gives you, now that we know why we might need a framework like this. Um, so it gives you semi-automatic model mirroring. We'll come back to what that means in a little bit. And this is what on the backbone side, they call models and collections. It gives you views that handle DOM events, which strangely enough are called views. And it gives you, and your views can optionally render markup themselves, right? 
And this is what Backbone calls templates. So let's go back to our comparison chart here. Uh, and so, as I mentioned just now, the model, uh, Backbone gives you this model mirroring. And so the models are actually conceptually more or less the same on both sides, right? You've got, um, they're meant to encapsulate some kind of business object, and on most Backbone Rails projects, your Backbone models end up being some subset of your Rails models with the same names. Uh, and a collection in Backbone land it corresponds to an array of models of the same type. So if you're doing user's index, you would have a collection of users, user models. So here's where the terminology starts to get confusing. Views and templates have nothing to do with views in Backbone. And in Backbone land, a, 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 a dumb template that's just interpolated HTML is called a template and not a view. And so you might ask, well, well okay, so what's a view? And a view really is a little piece of a controller, more or less, right? The, uh, it's basically a, um, uh, an object that owns a particular piece of the DOM, sets up instance variables for the templates, renders the templates, and handles events that occur in that region of the DOM. And uh, Backbone gives you something to deal with this that we'll look at in a moment. But the takeaway here is that uh, a Backbone view, when you hear Backbone view, don't think dumb template like you have in Rails. Think a piece of code that controls a certain region of the DOM. So has anyone in here done iOS programming or Cocoa programming or like GUI stuff? So for, for you guys, I think this will probably look pretty familiar. Like the backbone model of a view is very similar to the iOS model of a view, is very similar to the Cocoa model of a view. Uh, in fact, some people call the backbone views view controllers if you just want it to be even more confusing. Uh, but that is a concept you also find in iOS and Cocoa and so on. It's, it's, a, it's a view that controls a certain part of the screen that you're looking at. Um, so views are not templates. This is, may seem, I guess at this point, obvious. But uh, none of the backbone docs really make this explicit. And it took working with it for a while before I was able to articulate the differences here between the different types of things on the Rails side and the backbone side. And one of the reasons I really wanted to do this talk is that I think that uh, a lot of the docs for, for Backbone and for a lot of the other frameworks are written from a, a JavaScript developer's perspective. And a lot of Rails developers are not JavaScript developers, to begin with, at least. And so the docs that are available for some of these frameworks make a lot of assumptions about how much you understand JavaScript itself that may not hold true, at least didn't hold true for me when I was first learning this. So, let's take a break for a moment. Deep breath. Okay. That's mostly for me. Um, so, we've covered so far how it is that we came to this point where we need a framework and why you might want to use one, under what circumstances you might want to use it. So I want to show you a little bit about how Rails apps that I've seen actually use Backbone. And uh, I'm going to show you two very different patterns, uh, but you'll probably be able to see what I think of as the page class heritage in both of these patterns. So here we are, Greenfield apps. Um, and this is a pattern that I see, uh, as I said, in the agenda in a lot of Greenfield Rails applications. And it has to do with the fact that Rails is essentially only an API server. Um, and what that means is that on these apps that we, that, we, that we do, we tend to do no server-side rendering of HTML for, for the most part. Instead, we build a server that just serves data, usually via JSON, and we leave it up to the JavaScript to render everything that the user actually sees. So, Let's be clear, this is a lot of work compared to doing just a server-side rendered Rails application. And um, most apps don't need to do this. Uh, I would advise you to not do it if you can avoid it. Uh, but at Pivotal, we're starting to see a lot of companies coming in who want to do a website and a set of native mobile apps at the same time. And when you're doing that, I mean, you could debate about whether that's a great idea or not, but we're seeing a lot of it. Uh, and mobile apps and a website, a JavaScript client, have different API requirements, but if you have a RESTful API that produces JSON, you're most of the way there on both sides. So the main time that I see this pattern being used is when you are building both types of apps at once. 
So if Rails is just an API, you might wonder what your app views folder looks like. And usually you still have a layout uh, that's used in just one controller method, puts in the HTML head and body and does all the asset pipeline horrific stuff. And then in the body, it's pretty simplistic. You've got a div with an ID on it, and that's pretty much it. Then you need one controller method. This is the entire contents of your home controller. Use the layout. You tell it to use the layout we had in the last slide, and make sure it has a current user object. That's pretty much it. Renders the index template. So let's look at the index template. This is the entire index template. And we saw something like this when we were looking at page classes, right? The page class is a little bit different because it has something like this, and then it has all the markup underneath it, right? And the page class is sort of overlaying on top of that markup. But in this case, this is, the, this is it. That's pretty much it. Uh, although, uh, to, get the, to, get to, to get the application off the ground, sometimes we do end up sort of printing some of the data into the page, letting the Backbone app pick it up. So in this case, we are printing in the <clears throat> a JSON representation of the current user, which we will then pick up. And we'll look at that, what that does later. Uh, and then for all of your other controller methods, your products controller, your cart controller, what have you, uh, instead of rendering a view and returning that as a string to the browser, you just render the object you want as JSON and return that as a string to the browser. Um, and usually with a pattern like this, you end up with a set of decorators or something along those lines that um, gives you more control over what the JSON that comes out looks like. So on the Rails side, this is simple enough, right? Let's look at the JavaScript side. I want to go back here for a moment because there's going to be a lot of code on the next few slides. Just warning you. <laughs> and, and just to say it again, don't worry if you don't have time to read it all and figure it out because I'll be publishing all of this code with comments and annotations and stuff a little bit later in the week. Uh, but I do want to take you on a quick tour of what backbone code actually looks like in an application like this. So to start out with, uh, you usually have an app object of some kind. And, here it's just a plain old varred JavaScript object. This lives in its own file. We've graduated from putting JavaScript into our views. The JavaScript we saw before that initializes this application is the only JavaScript we have in the views at all. Um, it's got a set of model constructors. It's got a set of view constructors. And it has an initialize method. And the initialize is what's called in your Rails views in that one line of JavaScript that you have in your view. Uh, and the initialize method does two things. First, it creates a model instance that represents the current user. And second, it creates a view instance that controls the navigation bar. So typically, what you'll find in the, in the app level initialize method is uh, views that control all of the global pieces on your page, so headers, footers, anything that's uh, persistent, and any state that you need to maintain at an app level, in this case, the current user. And often, there's other things you need as well. Pretty straightforward so far. I don't see anyone nodding. That's a bad sign. All right, let's take a look at the user model, which is a little bit easier, a little less code. So uh, here's our user model. And it extends from backbone.model, um, from backbone.model, which gives you a bunch of useful functionality. Uh, and you can see here this has a URL root attribute. And that is a little bit of magic that tells backbone how to save and create and update a user object. So if you change um, any of the attributes on your user object and you call save on it, using the URL root attribute, backbone will figure out that it needs to do a put to users slash ID in order to update the user object. So that saves you from having to write a lot of this, what ends up being boilerplate Ajax code to persist uh, models and to get them. So where does it get the attributes to begin with? So backbone models do have a set of, of attributes that you can pass. And you can pass them into the initialize method, which is something that backbone gives you. And if you don't define an initialize in your model, which we're not here, it just sets all of those attributes when you call it. And in our case, these attributes came from the JSON data that we printed into the page. So if you remember back here in our Rails view, we printed JSON representing the current user into the page, into the initialize uh, method, which brings us over here to the, initial, to the app level initialization, where we have current user data being passed into it, which we then pass to 
uh, the user's initialize method. And so all of those attributes, whatever gets returned from to JSON on the user, which is you know, first name, last name, whatever it is that you want, uh, gets set on the user model. OK. So that's models. Let's move on to the view. The view's a little bit scary. The view's a lot of code. Let's, we'll, but we'll get through it together. OK, so here's our navbar view. Now, this extends from backbone.view, uh, just like our user model extended backbone.model. And then we're passing it an object that includes a bunch of overrides of built-in backbone view behavior. So the first thing we're doing is we're giving it the name of a template, in this case, uh, just navbar, which means we've got a template defined in our uh, app assets JavaScript's templates directory called navbar that we're going to render. Uh, and then we, have, we give it a class name. So each view controls a little piece of DOM. And in this case, what you're telling it is, I want you to make a div. I want you to give it this class. And then when it renders the template, it will put all of the rendered HTML inside of a div with that class. And then we have the events hash, which is a set of DOM events that we care about that will occur inside of this view. And the events object is built into backbone views. And the keys of this object are <clears throat> DOM events you care about within this view, plus the selector of the element that they should occur on. So for example, we care about two events. We care about a click event that happens on any element with dot profile. And we care about click events that happen on a, uh, any element with class main logo. And the, the values of this object are then strings representing the functions that should be called when these events are caught. So Backbone will automatically set up a click handler on any element with dot profile that then calls the method show profile menu. And uh, the font's already too small on this, so I didn't put in, but there actually is a show profile menu method function, rather, and a go home function in this navbar view that would get called when these events uh, occur. So, so in our initialize here, uh, I want to point out a couple of interesting things that are happening in this initialize. Uh, we do two things. One is that we bind our model's change event to, to the model's change event. Now, this dot model uh, is one of those magic things. And if you remember, back in our app, our app level object, we passed in uh, the current user as the model to the view. Now, a view has this idea of either owning a particular model or owning a collection of models. In this case, we're saying, OK, you own this one model, this current user. Um, and that's because usually the nav bar shows something having to do with your profile, your profile picture, your name. So it needs the current user in order to do that. So in our view, in our initialize, uh, the first thing we do is we bind the change event. And uh, this is uh, one of those things that Backbone provides you. And what we're saying is when this model changes, re-render the nav bar. Right, so you could imagine someone updates their profile, they change their first name, they change their profile image, whatever it is. You want to re-render the nav bar so that it reflects the changes that they've made. Um, and then we render the nav bar in the initialize, which is something you can do. It's not always done. So finally, let's look at the render method. Um, basically, all it's doing is it's getting the template uh, which is actually a function that corresponds to the template name that we've assigned it. And then it's calling that function, passing in the model as essentially its instance variables. And then it's replacing the HTML of its element with whatever comes back from the call to render, which should be an HTML string. And that's pretty much it. So coming back to our app object, we've set up the current user, and we've set up the nav bar, which is the the one piece of DOM that appears on every page, right? So what happens to everything else, right? There's, in most apps, there's a big main content area. Even apps that are designed to single page apps, there's a big content area that gets swapped in and out in response to certain events, right? Um, like clicking on the nav bar, or there's lots of different things that can do it, right? So handling those types of events is one of the places where backbone code bases diverge dramatically. Uh, there's no blessed way to do this in backbone. So you see lots of different approaches. Um, 
And often it's a sort of a graduation of the page class pattern where we've got a page, a backbone view for each conceptual page in the object, which then has a set of subviews that control the components that are within that page. Um, and it's attached to a particular DOM element. In this case, it's the content div that we had in our Rails layout. And it has a set of events. And so like other views, it has a render method that's not shown here that renders itself and its subviews. Um, now some of these events cause a change of page, right? Like show product. So you click on a related product and you want to uh, change the view to a different show product view with a different product, right? So as I said, there's, there's literally hundreds of ways to handle this. Um, one of the ones that I've seen a lot is something like this. You end up with a, a global publish subscribe in your application level object. So here's what the subscribe looks like. It's pretty straightforward. Basically, when you subscribe to an event, the app object adds uh, the function that you want called the list of functions that will be called when that event is caught. Uh, and the publish uh, is basically what you might expect. You publish an event name and give it some data, and it goes through and calls all of the functions that have registered to be called when that event is caught and passes in the data. So just to close this loop, what would happen here, oh, and then you would, so, <laughs> right. One way to uh, catch the page change events is to use this publish subscribe system to publish, to subscribe to, at the app level, a change page event. And then you have to have a little mapping in there that says, okay, when I get this, I need to make this type of view, swap it out of the, of the, of the DOM. Uh, and this requires you to keep a current page as a piece of global state, which is pretty not that bad. And then, uh, but you also need to be careful that you're removing references to the views when you move them out of the DOM so they don't, so they can be garbage collected. Um, and just to, to, to close this loop, here's what happens inside of your product uh, view when you actually want to publish one of these events, right? You say, um, publish change page, and then you give it some data. Uh, and that will pass all that information to the handlers that need to be called. And there's a lot of other ways to do this. Um, one of them involves using Backbone's router, which is an optional piece. It used to be called the controllers. Then uh, I think they felt like that was maybe a little bit too close. So, uh, so they changed it, now it's the router. And uh, that has the advantage of using push state to change the URL that the user is looking at, which otherwise just stays the same until you do a page refresh. Okay, let's take a break. That was a lot of code. That was sort of a whirlwind tour of, of what I think of as the backbone full Monty, right? It's a very uh, typical way to build a Greenfield Rails app these days. Um, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot, there's a lot of code there. A lot of it is fairly dense. If you're not used to JavaScript, it can be a little opaque and intimidating. Uh, and there's a lot of code in there that really is boilerplate. And it's, there's less of it than if you had started writing it yourself. Uh, but there's still a lot, right? There's still a lot of code you have to write there, a lot of code you have to test, a lot of code you have to maintain, a lot of code you have to explain to new Ruby developers coming on the project that don't really understand JavaScript that well. Um, and because Backbone has no particular opinion about where code should go, especially if you have a large team or if you have a team that's not that experienced with JavaScript, you end up accumulating code debt pretty quickly. Um, on the other hand, most people who are experienced JavaScript developers really have no problem jumping into Backbone. So that's a good thing. Uh, so, so if you're in the situation of doing a Greenfield Rails app, uh, you might wonder if Backbone is really the right choice for a client-side app of that type. Um, and I'll get to that in a bit. But first I want to talk about what happens if you don't have this beautiful Greenfield. Right? What if you've got this, and clear cutting is not an option? Uh, so what if you have an app that's already doing mostly server-side rendering, but your product people are starting to ask for you to move towards a more fluid client-side app experience? So that brings us to the second pattern I want to discuss, which is backbone is frosting. So that looks really, I'm really hungry, it looks good. <laughs> 
Uh, so if you've got a Rails app that's already doing mostly server-side rendering, and you need to move towards client-side rendering, this is where the lightweightness of Backbone really starts to be an advantage. And the code that you write looks very similar to the code for the full Monty. You still have an app object. Oops, sorry. You still have an app object that's instantiated on every page load and sets some global state. And the difference is that maybe you put this in your layout instead of at the top of your page. Uh, but in Backbone is very forgiving. If you want to have some of your Backbone views render client-side templates, and some of them just overlay on top of server-side rendered markup, Backbone's cool with that. Uh, and what that means is that rather than, than clear-cutting right, and doing a full rewrite, which is a very risky thing to do, uh, you can incrementally convert rendering your views from server-side rendering to client-side rendering. And you can start with a Backbone view like this. This is the nav bar view that we saw before. Uh, rewritten so that it uses, so that it can be overlaid on top of a nav bar element that's rendered on the server. And you'll notice it has an L attribute rather than a class name attribute, and no template before it had a template. And so that means that it will look for that class in the markup and it will take over that area. Right? Uh, and from then on, it's as, it's as if the markup was rendered by the view itself, and you can still use events. So um, the main difference is that instead of rendering, Instead of binding the change method of the model to render, we bind it to this method that goes out and fetches the nav bar over again and then puts it back into the div. And uh, I've been on projects where we just called that render, uh, even though it's not actually rendering, it's actually just pulling stuff off the server. Uh, but I prefer to be more explicit about the fact that this is not a render right now, but it could be. You could change it to be a render later. And because over time, what you might want to do is convert some of these things to server-side rendering, or to client-side rendering, rather, um, rather than fetching this nav bar on its own. So we've looked in pretty excruciating detail, I think, at two different patterns for using Backbone within Rails. Um, first, when you have a greenfield app that may or may not need a mobile app, and you're dedicated to sort of a fluid app-like feel on the client side. And the second, when you have an existing application that your product folks are just asking to feel more modern. And I suppose it's obvious by now that while I'm, uh, that I like using Backbone with Greenfield applications, but if I were starting one right now, I would look at some of the frameworks that don't require you to write as much boilerplate. I would look at Ember.js, I would look at Meteor, there's a lot of different things that are coming out right now. Um, and uh, secondarily, I think that Backbone's sweet spot is converting an existing Rails app to a more client-side feel. I think that uh, we, there's a lot of, of, of JavaScript frameworks that are moving in a more opinionated direction, which as Rails developers, or at least as a Rails developer, I like that. I like the fact that Rails um, lets you give up flexibility in exchange for velocity. And I think our uh, JavaScript frameworks on the whole are moving in that direction. Um, but if you do have an app that already exists that you're trying to convert, um, Backbone is a great choice because it is so flexible. And with that, I think we have a few minutes for questions, two or three minutes. Thank you very much.